Jens suggested I wanted to talk about um, ligaments, and I started going that direction and then realized that some of the more unusual bone slash soft tissue processes at the cranial cervical junction are a little more interesting, particularly from an imaging viewpoint. So that's what we're talking about. The processes, uh, what we're talking about, will be they're inflammatory processes and then they're masses. And the inflammatory, everyone talks about rheumatoid arthritis. I don't know how much you talk about CPPD, which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, which I will hereafter just call CPPD because I can't get the words out fast enough. There are other connective tissue processes that happen up there. And believe it or not, you can get osteomyelitis of C1. Not fun, but happens. Then we talk about the masses, their primary tumors, metastatic tumors, and you can occasionally get a chordome up there. And the big take home is one, you've got to image them all with probably everything you've got in your armamentarium, which you're going to start with plain fields, but you're going to have to have a CT and you're going to have to have an MR because nothing will answer everything. And the other thing is, We'll try and give you a differential, but we're going to be more or less limited by what the clinical history is, and you're going to have a better idea than we are because they all look very, very similar. So his first case is a, um, I'm, oh, there we go. It's a 52-year-old woman with a 20-year history of RA, so we're going to start with the sort of standard ones. So she came in with three months of upper neck pain radiating to the right occiput. It was episodic, it became con uh, constant. And what you have is an X-ray, a CT, and an MR. Uh, the X-ray, as usual, is not particularly helpful except to say that nothing has sublux when she's vertical and somewhat weight-bearing. What she has is a lanoaxial subluxation, which is one of the things we commonly, or, that you can see with end stage or late stage M rheumatoid arthritis. And when you look at the MR, it's not all that clear. And I don't know whether I have a pointer, but uh, behind. Oh, let me show you. Oh, is this a pointer? This is a pointer. Is this a pointer or what? Is this a pointer? This is a pointer. Uh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a pointer. <laughs> it was a pointer. It is not a pointer. I can, I can get up and wag, wag my hands at it if you like. But behind the dens, there's a soft tissue panis. But there, most of this panis is actually anterior to dens with a widened ADI uh, distance. Uh, if you look at the series of MRs, and uh, I'm sorry they're dark, at least maybe they're not so dark on your screen. On, the, on your left is a T1, in the middle is a stir-ish kind of sequence. On the far, on your right is a T1. And really, for her, there's nothing in the canal. You're not worried about cord, but she has this unstable ring of C1, which probably is not moving, but is clearly causing her pain. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. It, in about a fifth half of the patient, she'll have some degree of cervical involvement. The severity tends to follow the disease duration, which means almost everyone will have cervical involvement, but you have to have very long involvement to get to the stage of what this woman has. The cervical involvement and even this appearance, I think, has been markedly decreasing since there have been anti-rheumatoid drugs that are actually reasonably effective. What, you see, what rheumatoid is is an inflammatory uh, process attaching, targeting synovium, so you get a panis, which is really synovial hypertrophy and villus fronds, so you just get this big, for our, for our purposes, a big solid clump of tissue. The cartilage and bone get destroyed, you can get synovial cyst, and the ligaments get lax, hence that lady who was subluxed. Uh, the atlanoaxial uh, instability is in like, some, Papers are all over the map. Some people say 20%, some people say 80%. I think it probably very much depends on the cohort you're looking at. Uh, it's really the transverse ligament which has a bursa between the ring of C1 and the dens, and that's what we're getting into. Uh, you can compress the uh, C2 nerves, which is some of the pain. Uh, there's anterior sublux in 70% and some you can get posterior subluxation, but you don't get cord compression in the great majority. It's possible, but it's not usually the present presenting factor. They're not usually going to present with a myelopathy. 
Uh, the other thing you can get with RA is basilar invagination, which is a way big, harder one. I think I'm a little out of order, but anyway. That's, again, ligament laxity, but it's the upper ligaments. It's not the, just the transverse ligament. You're talking about the alar ligaments and the apical ligaments and basically the cruciate ligament. Uh, you can end up with lower cranial neuropathies because the dens is settling, the head is settling on the dens. Patients also come in with pain, and they come in with deformity and myelopathy. And this is a really long, slow process. So patients have been deformed probably for years, and then they come in when they finally get, it just hit, they hit the tipping point. So here is your typical, luckily not. Should we try the, we try the pointer? Lee is right there. Ah, OK. It's the top button here. Oh, it's the top button. I thought it was. I thought the top button was my uh, switcher button. Apparently, it's both. Okay. Okay. So, if you look right there, her dens is way above the foramen magnum. Uh, if you look here, if you went, we're looking at the CT, her. Articulation of C0, C1 is both wide and eroded. And if you look here, you can see on the coronal reformation that you have the same process. So basically, the whole cranial cervical junction has, it's not quite disintegrated, but it's no longer uh, active. Uh, when you look at MR, it looks way scarier, I should say. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Remember, this, she has hand numbness, gait instability, and subjective weakness. She is myelopathic, but she's been developing this for a while. This is not like your trauma patient who comes in and acutely hit, comes at you with a, uh, you know there's something going on. And if you look on her, the panis is both anterior, pushing the ring of C1 forward, and it's this big soft tissue mass coming up. and it. It is sort of nondescript on imaging. It's what I mean, it's sort of intermittent signal on all sequences. It's not very indicative. It's just it's there. So we all say RA because that's what we expect. And that's the example. And just for those who cannot remember the lines, because most of us don't use them very often, there are a number of ways to evaluate them. Uh, most of the papers talk about uh, you need two or three to confirm the diagnosis because no one line works. So the McRae line, which is the red line, is goes from the Bayesian to the Opistion, and your dens has to stay below it. Chamberlain's line and McGregor's line are almost exactly the same. McGregor's line was left over from the pagetoid era when the skull was soft and sank. So Chamberlain is hard palate to Opistion. McGregor is hard palate to the bottom of the skull, which is why it's the pagetoid line, because you were going, the, the skull was sinking, not just the, the dens was riding up. And on those, you had some portion of the dens above it. Clark's line, which I don't have fully described here, is you take that blue line, which is the approximate ring of C1, best as I could figure out on this image, and there are, you divide the dens into three, and if any of the bottom two-thirds of the dens is above that line, you're abnormal. Uh, the, uh, the Johnson line, the Redland-Johnson line is that orange line, so it goes from that axial line down, and Ranawatt's line goes from the mid-body of the odontoid down. They're all variations on the same thing, which is the dens lies up. Uh, we don't talk about them much, so I thought I'd just may bring them out so people could see them. So that so this lady has a basal imagination. So now we get to the next lady, who is a 76-year-old woman who had a history of endometrial cancer, cancer, no RA, never had RA, doesn't have any symptoms of it, and she fell, which is how we got to her. And if you look, she's got a wide ADI interval. She's not basilar, she's not a sublux upward. In fact, most people are not. And she's got erosions, so can I, I don't, I guess I don't like this point. This point is making me crazy. She's got erosions in the ring of C1 right there. That's just a big hole. She's got erosions and subchondral cysts in the dens. And you can see her very, very wide AD angle, a distance, excuse me. And 
what she has is CPPD, which is why I say they all look alike. Uh, about 7% of adults are thought to have it pathologically. Uh, but if you start looking at all the joints in the body and the discs, and the, you know, which means ankles and elbows and wrists, and you find you may have 30 to 60 percent of adults who are over 85 will have some evidence of it. It has a number of names. It's chondrocalcinosis. Sometimes it's called pseudo doubt. Sometimes it's called pyrophosphate arthropathy. Majority of times, it's asympt it's asymptomatic. It's just something that we're seeing. Uh, one of the if you're looking at the peripheral joints, it tends to be symmetrical. But when you're looking at this process at the cranial cervical junction, it looks like RA. And it's very, if you start looking at a lot of the, the dens on many of the uh, MRs on older folks, you're going to see a panis, usually not big. So this is another patient with CPPD, asymptomatic. She came in for standard neck imaging for neck pain. So it's just an incidental finding, effectively, but if not really visible on CT. If you look really hard and had really good soft tissue windows, um, get this out of the way, you could see it. In fact, the papers tend to talk about it, not in terms of MR, but in terms of CT. There's a fairly good series by Resnick. The trick on the, the way to honestly make the diagnosis is if you look preferably on the axial, because the coronals, oh, I can't use this mic, but coronals don't tend to work, you're going to see calcification in the ring. And so one way, you're not going to, MR is not going to be helpful. MR is going to look like every other soft tissue mass. If you think that's the process, if you look for calcification in the ring, you'll see it at varying degrees. And it's, sometimes it's fluffy, sometimes it's linear, but the calcification is there. What you see on MR is, again, a panis. But this one tends to not be the anterior ADI interval. It tends to be more posterior. It's just a soft tissue mass that happens to be there that's not doing anything that makes radiologists a little nuts. However, it too can have its uh, less than wonderful moments. So this is another lady who's elderly. Remember, all of these patients are at least 80 to 85, uh, who has head and neck pain not really, not talking about her myelopathy, has had neck pain. She has no other symptoms. All those, well, that list is negative, except she does have inflammatory markers. And when you look at her CT, maybe here, and you look carefully right here, there's a big soft tissue mass back there. And if you look here really carefully, there's a big soft tissue mass with a little calcium. And if you look on her MR, she has a big soft tissue mass compressing the cord. <laughs> uh, so on, you have a T2, a uh, stir, and a post-GAD T1. The stuff doesn't enhance, but you get marginal enhancement, probably some from inflammatory stuff. She, you can get this, uh, the same kind of subchondral cysts and erosion in the dens. This was operated on because she was compressed and it's CPPD. They found, the path was a little equivocal, but they found crystals in the tissue. So this is another lady who has another connective tissue disease, not RA, long-standing, lupus, sojourns, um, but she did not have the actual RA markers. If you look at her ring of C1, her dens is a little bit, sort of out, again, plain films are not really helpful, so you probably don't want to, whether you start there or not, that's not, you better move out of them pretty fast. And again, she has the same kind of panis formation at the top, some erosion here of her joints. Sometimes people call this osteoarthritis. I don't, I, I think there's a lot of confusion about what the entities are, but they all look the same. And RA is the only one that has a clear, RA and CPPD are the only ones that have clear diagnostic names. Uh, one more. Then there are the infections. We talked about other infections. I had two, I only brought you one. One came in a guy with a retropharyngeal abscess that just 
didn't get under control. This is a guy who is another one of our IBDUs, just like we t you talked about earlier, who has history of drugs, has hep C, has, was back to remake with MSSA, has another septic joint, and ends up with a destructive process in C1, which is his osteomyelitis. Uh, probably the only, if I try to give a differential on this other than his history, you might say there's a little more destructive process around the dens than in the other ones. But again, this is where I get into the business of MR is not your sine qua non, because you're gonna, both of you are gonna start with an MR. I mean, that's the way you go. CT's not, y'all go. Neurologic problems, both spine, let's go to the MR, which is what you ought, ought to do. But then we're gonna get this MR that looks like this, which is the same kind of panis at the top, and we're gonna have to go to the CT to get some sense of what actually is happening to the bone and what the areas of destruction are. And even then, we're still gonna say, here, let's go back and look at the patient and see what his, his issues are. Uh, now we go to the, Little more standard things, but they still get to the dens. This is a gentleman who happens to have an incidental plasma cytoma in C2. He was sent in because he had an incidental plasma cytoma in C2. Again, this is the MR. Uh, it's just, you know, a standard med, no problem. He didn't get the CT pre op, or if he got one, I couldn't find it. So I only have the post-op CT to show you why we need the CT. Because there's no bone there. And I would assume from a surgical viewpoint, you might like to know that before you operate. Just in terms of what's going on. You could see a little bit of lucency on the plain film, but not a lot. Again, strange things at the ring of C1. So here's another gentleman who uh, came in with Decreased sensation in his hands for like a few weeks, some neck pain, some weight loss, sounds like a standard cancer. And this turns out to be a B-cell lymphoma. Only difference from the other Mets is there's maybe a little more bone involvement. But so we're still we're still going back to the take home. You need both, and you don't, we're not gonna be really good at differentials. And this is the last case, I believe this is the last case. This is a 24-year-old who we saw because she was coming for a second opinion. She had a chordoma. This, this is residual chordoma we're looking at now. Again, a big mass at C1. In this case, C2, excuse me. But with, this, with a big destructive process. And again, when you look at the MR, and maybe that's the take home, the MRs all look very similar for the kind of soft tissue masses you're gonna see. Big soft tissue panis, uh, the signal characteristics don't help. This is a chordoma, so it doesn't, it's sort of patchy, non specific kind of not very good enhancement. So, that was a very fast run through of a number of entities, which I guess I have to say, we're really good at telling you where it is, we're really good at telling you what's compromised we may not be so good at telling you what it is, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you.